Well, welcome to this new Wormix webinar on the VivoChip. We're excited to share with you the uh, two important applications of this technology uh, so far. Uh, I am Dr. Gina Lento, Head of Operations at New Wormix, and I'll be your moderator for the webinar. With me live today are Evan Hegarty, who will be presenting on the company and the technology, and Adam Lang, who will be describing the first two of our applications uh, in uh, scientific studies. Um, let's, uh, let me show you who the full team is. So the full New Wormix team shown here includes myself on the end. I have a PhD in biochemistry and have been a serial COO for life science companies for 18 years. Co-founder Adela Benyakar holds the Harry L. Kent Professorship in Mechanical Engineering at UT Austin. She specializes in femtosecond laser surgery, two-photon microscopy, high-speed imaging, and microfluidics. Her research has been cited more than 5,000 times in the scientific literature. Co-founder Evan Hegarty is the director of manufacturing uh, and the engineering mind behind the designs of the v various VivoChip um, microfluidic devices. Dr. Adam Lang is our senior scientist with a background in stem cell and 3D organoid culture, specializing in the use of microfluidics for high throughput screening of biological samples. Dr. Sudeep Mandal is a veteran C. elegans researcher at UT Austin in the Benyakar lab and serves as a scientific and technical advisor for the VivoChip. Our agenda today will be as follows. Evan will present first on the company and the technology. Then Adam will present two studies showing different applications of the VivoChip technology and a note on future application webinars that we're planning. Evan will return with a quick sketch of our current and new product offerings. And then, as I mentioned, we'll take, that will all take about 15 minutes, then we'll go to our Q&A session. Uh, I see in the chat window there are no troubleshooting questions, so let's go ahead and proceed. Evan. Thank you for the, thank you for the introduction, Gina. So again, I'm Evan Hegarty, and uh, New Wormix began as a spin-out from Dr. Adela Benyakar's lab at the University of Texas at Austin. After patenting and publishing our high-throughput immobilization and imaging platform, we began to realize the huge potential that this technology has. So over the past five years, we've had some key milestones that I wanna share. We founded New Wormix in 2016 with the goal of accelerating high resolution and image-based phenotypic screening in C. elegans and in other in vivo and in vitro models. In 2017, we received the UT Innovation Award to translate the technology for, for commercial applications. We received our first NIH SBIR award in 2018 to further develop the VivoChip platform. 2019 was a big year for us. We began academic sales, we had two of our patents approved, and then we received another phase one SBIR for our organoid chip work. This year, we received a phase two SBIR award for the VivoChip and neurotoxicity assays. So we now have customers at various universities and research institutes around the world, from the NIH to University of Crete, from Osaka University to the University of British Columbia. So you can see the international reach of our products and systems. So why we chose to work with C. elegans? Well, we love C. elegans. We all know that the advantages of C. elegans outweigh the disadvantages. And with the addition of CRISPR technology, gene editing is even easier and opens up more possibilities with C. elegans. And as an invertebrate, C. elegans completely avoids ethical and regulatory constraints around animal research, and importantly, is still a whole model organism. So with C. elegans, you usually have the option to do high throughput imaging or high resolution imaging, but not both, until now. New Wormix VivoChip platform allows for both high throughput and high resolution imaging of C. elegans. This example is three worms out of the 40 that we captured in this one device. So this is our VivoChip 2X. It's a simple to use microfluidic chip. Each device in the VivoChip contains an inlet and an outlet and is connected to 40 side-by-side -side microfluidic channels on a number one glass slide, which allows for high resolution imaging with any objective. These three-dimensionally tapering channels have been designed to help orient and immobilize the 40C elegans laterally within each device. 
A video will demonstrate this shortly. So this lateral orientation could not be achieved without the vivo cube. The vivo cube applies a proprietary intermittent pressure sequence to immobilize the elegans in a favorable orientation within the vivo chip. So here are the components of the full system, which include not only the vivo chip and vivo cube, but the pump, the tubing, and the buffer reservoir as well. Once the automatic button is pushed, within three minutes, the system and the vivo chip geometry will orient and immobilize the C. elegans in their lateral orientation for high resolution imaging in your microscope with any magnification objective. So here's a video of the VivoChip 2X in action. The precise combination of intermittent pressures with the custom designed tapering channels serve to guide their worms into the lateral orientation during loading. If you look closely, you can see that these channels taper in the X, Y direction, but they also taper in the Z direction. Now notice the high loading efficiency of this process. This red box indicates the area that we will be imaging. So after two minutes, we have a fill rate of 95%, and of those worms, over 90% are oriented favorably for high resolution imaging. Now, how does this compare with the current methods used? As many of you know, with the current method, we start by heating and making agar, which maybe takes 10 minutes or so. Then you pick maybe 10 to 20 worms, wait for the anesthetic to take effect. So in 20 to 35 minutes, you get 50 to 70% of the worms in a favorable orientation. So compared to using the VivoChip method, even the VivoChip 2X, within five minutes, you get 35 to 40 worms oriented to image phenotypes in high resolution in densely packed channels. So this method saves time, it dramatically increases your sample size, it eliminates the need for anesthetic, it gives uniform worm spacing and predictable orientation which streamlines imaging and increases the information per pixel. So with this resource, you expand the research potential of your lab greatly. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Adam Lang. Hi there, I'm Dr. Adam Lang, and today I'd like to show you a couple of applications of our technology. So first thing I'm gonna talk about is germline imaging in 3D. Um, as many of you know, C. elegans has a 3D germline structure. It's got two arms extending along the length of the body and has a 3D architecture which intertwines the intestine. Uh, this makes it difficult to, to capture with imaging. It's therefore necessary that you image the entire thing along its axis and multiple planes to capture the entire structure. Now you can do this with traditional microscopy, uh, but uh, with a VIVA chip, you can get the same high resolution data with large numbers of animals. And in that way, you can get population level statistics and quantitative phenotypic distributions. Uh, some of you may also be familiar with the COPAS biosorter, which allows imaging of many animals at high speed. However, uh, the COPAS biosorter captures one dimensional information and has a resolution of about 30 microns. So it's a bit limited in the phenotypes it can distinguish. So even finding individual embryos is uh, pretty hard with it. Uh, it's also possible that it can't distinguish uh, some debris or, or particles in the animals, from the animals. So one potential use of the VO chip is for studying developmental and reproductive biology in C. elegans. The string is shown here is a uh, GFP and N cherry under the control of the Pi1 gene, so it's expressed in the germ length. Using the VO chip, we were able to uniformly immobilize these worms and image them in 3D using a light heart automated microscope although the VivoChip platform is compatible with pretty much any microscope platform out there. Uh, for the study, we began by immobilizing the 40 worms and imaging that to low resolution, uh, about uh, two to four X. Uh, this allowed us to get measurements of large scale features, such as the, the body dimensions, the length, the diameter, um, the number of uh, embryos, and even the number of viable embryos by looking at the number of uh, moving embryos within the eggshells. And then during the same experiment, we could switch to a high NA 20x objective, which could be capture Z stacks with a high NA and uh, they could be stitched together to capture the entire germline in 3D high resolution. And these can be used to study details such as uh, germline organization, cell division, chromatin organization, and apoptosis. Uh, these are two uh, images from the same experiment just zoomed in. 
uh, showing the entire germline and uh, oocytes passing through the germline. You can observe individual uh, oocyte stage of oocyte formation as they pass through the packeting stage, um, through spermatica, um, and all the way up to embryonic development, all the way up to egg laying. Uh, this allows us to study how mutations or chemicals can perturb the system and can be used, for example, to pinpoint the mechanisms of uh, compounds reproductive toxicity, for example. So we've used the VIVA chip to study the effects of toxic compounds on embryo viability in the worms. Here you can see a close-up of embryos in a, a day one adult worm, which is exposed to bisphenol A from L1. The chemical causes chromatin abnormalities uh, that renders a percentage of the embryos non-viable. You can see this even without fluorescent markers by looking for the movement of embryos within each eggshell. If you look at the left embryo, it's not moving, while the right embryo is turning within the eggshell, indicating that it is viable. Uh, with the VIVA chip, we can also immobilize and image the worms without anesthetic. This is because uh, anesthetics can cause muscle contractions and might lead to premature laying of the developed eggs, which would give you some skewed data. So conventionally, developmental and reproductive toxicity studies, otherwise known as DART, use mice, rabbits, and other higher animals, which means that slow and expensive and increasingly it's restricted by animal welfare regulations also. Uh, so we thought that C. elegans could be a viable alternative. Um, so while we know these worms can be quite cute and fluffy too, uh, standard laboratory strains are prepared for the Bebo chip. Because we can rapidly image many worms uh, at once, it gives us statistical power. Uh, so we wanted to take advantage of this to study DART. Uh, to test this, we looked at the range of uh, compounds that recognize DART toxicity on multiple phenotypic endpoints, including body length, body diameter, the uh, total number of embryos, and the subset of embryos that were viable. This example shown here shows worms treated from L1 with the ranges of doses of the developmental and reproductive inhibitor FEDR. Uh, FEDR treatment causes a severe decrease in body size at above about 100 micromolar, and at above uh, about 10 micromolar, the drug also significantly affected embryo viability. Uh, the trends we see are consistent across multiple experiments, and this indicates the C. elegans model could be a viable DART assay alternative. So the second application I'm going to talk to you about today is a high resolution imaging of neurodegeneration. C. elegans has a complete and well characterized nervous system and it contains the same subtypes of neurons as humans, including dopaminergic, gabaergic, cholinergic, serotonergic, all, all, all the major subtypes. So it's therefore a good model for screening potential neurological toxins, for example. Uh, these could be from things like the pharmaceutical, industrial, and petrochemical industries. Uh, so for this particular study, we took advantage of a dopaminergic neuron reporter, which has a DAT1 GFP experienced in the neurons. Um, and at sublethal concentrations, uh, toxicants can induce subtle but reproduci reproducible phenotypes in these neurons. Uh, the phenotypes indicated in the diagram here are uh, beating and blabular dendrites, broken neural processes, loss of the sensory tips, and structural deformation in the dendrites as indicated on these outlines. Uh, a key advantage of the VIVA chip for this kind of study is that it gives us proper lateral orientation to image the neurons of interest at high resolution. And being able to guarantee all the neurons are raised laterally and we can image them along their entire journal and along their entire length is a key feature of our system and it makes it practical to gather the number of data points from individual neurons needed to plot the dose responsive curves uh, and calculate statistical significance. We used the strain in the VIVA chip to show how C. elegans could be used to quantify neural degeneration caused by a neurotoxic compound, in this case MPP iodide, uh, which damages dopaminergic neurons specifically. The worms were treated from L1 stage with different doses and they were put in the VIVA chip and the head regions were imaged about 20x, uh, 0.75 NA. This gives us high resolution Z stacks of all the dopaminergic neurons in each worm, around about 40 worms in total at each dose. Uh, we could then identify the different phenotypes indicative of neural degeneration uh, with individual dendrites. 
a few times we scored were beating, uh, blebbing, um, breaks and, and tip loss as I described before. Uh, examples of these features are pointed out in the diagrams and also in the microscope images themselves. We did multi-parametric analysis, in other words, analyzing all these phenotypes. Uh, this is important to understand the extent of degradation. The first uh, kind of degradation you see is beading. Uh, it's the most commonly recorded phenotype. However, later on, this can lead to full breaks in the dendrites. Uh, beading and tip loss are rarer phenotypes, but they're associated with highly degenerated neurons and higher concentrations of MPP. For each worm, we recorded the presence or absence of these phenotypes in each neuron for statistical significance. So this is the full picture showing multi-parametric degeneration analysis for each drug concentration. Uh, the average percentage shown by the black line of the neurons that showed some form of degeneration increases as the MPP concentration rises. The toxicity becomes significant above about uh, 0.1 millimolar uh, and more severe phenotypes such as deformation and tip loss are observed as the concentration goes higher. Above about 2 millimolar, the drug killed the majority of worms or arrested their development at an earlier larval stage. So the full details of these two studies I described today uh, can be found on our website. If you're also interested in protein aggregation models in C. elegans, which uh, many of you are, we've also got an application note on this topic. Um, this will be the focus of our next webinar, which will introduce the VivoChip 96X and it's used in high throughput screening. We'll let you know when this will be presented, if you're interested in hearing about the study in more detail, or you're considering doing your own high throughput screens in worms. And as well as these studies, uh, this series are some of our different applications people are finding for our system. Some of you may recognize these images. Uh, these are a few images taken by some of our many customers using the Viva chip. Uh, these images and more can be found on our customers testimonials page on our website. And if you're interested in taking advantage of the viewership yourselves, then Evan will wrap this up by taking you through the product details and what we currently offer. All right, thank you very much, Adam. So at New Wormix, we have a wide range of vivo chips to study different age worms from the earliest larval stage through day five adult. And each vivo chip 2X is on a number one glass slide substrate has two independent immobilization devices, each with 40 trapping channels, and is compatible with inverted and upright microscopes using any magnification objective. So to run the Vivo chips, you get a Vivo cube and a starter kit, which includes all the equipment needed to set up and run experiments. C. elegans not included. What is included is a live video call with instructions from a member of the New Ormix team. So our upcoming products include our VivoChip 96X system. This new chip contains 96 wells, each leading to a 40 channel device, resulting in nearly 4,000 channels to trap worms. New Ormix is also offering high content toxicology screening service to provide developmental neurotoxicology endpoints using C. elegans models. The high throughput screening platform will enable multiple parameter and neuron specific toxicology assessments using major neurotransmitter systems and allow our customers to gain insight into neuronal toxicology outcomes of chemicals from an in vivo model with system level information at the speed and cost of an in vitro system. Our ultimate goals are to protect public health by early identification of environmental chemicals with DNT to prioritize industrial chemicals that require further testing and help industries to reduce animal testing while meeting regulatory compliance. If you have any questions about pricing, please contact us and we would be happy to discuss your needs and send you a custom quote. So thank you very much for joining us today. You know, please email us or go to our website for any further information and we will now begin the Q&A session. Thank you, Adam and Evan. Um, we have several questions coming through. Let's see, here's, let's start with this one. Uh, how many, how long can worms stay alive in, uh, in the vivo chip? We image worms in the same chip. Oh, if we image worms in the same chip, 
let's say one to two hours apart, do we know if there are any differences in the morphology or health condition? So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, there, we've tested this and there is no observable difference in the ear degeneration. Um, if you uh, do that for that long, they survive at least two hours. Um, so some of our, our users have been uh, adding extra bacteria to the, the media that the, the worms are in the view would trip in, which allows them to defeat during the experiment and keeps them even, even healthier. Yeah, I'll just add in that um, some of our customers have kept the, the worms in the vivo chip for six hours to eight hours during that imaging. And they did add a dense bacteria solution to the buffer so that it just kind of surrounded the worms. But they seem to have a good success and no sign of neuronal degeneration based on being in there for a long period of time. Great guys, thanks. Um, here's the next question. Uh, do adult worms still ovulate in the chips? Is it possible to consistently image ov the ovulation process within the chip? Um, well, we haven't actually observed this directly. Uh, some of our, our customers are interested in studying ovulation. The worms can't actually lay their eggs when they're trapped in the channels because they can't get into the position necessary to, to, to lay eggs. Um, however, we'd, so we'd be interested in, in hearing from anyone who wants to work with us um, uh, to see if this will be a possible experiment to do. Uh, as, as we described before, the worms are able to survive in the, in the chip for six to eight hours, so they should still produce eggs. Great, thank you. Um, the next one, um, th there have been several on just a couple of basics about the chip. Um, how many times can we reuse the Vivo chip? So yeah, I'll, I'll answer that one. That's a great question. Um, it really depends on your study. It's definitely reusable. We reuse it, you know, two, three, four times. I know um, some customers have been able to reuse it up to 10 times as well. Again, it depends on what your goal is. I usually, when I do a consultation with someone who buys the chip, we talk about what you're trying to get out of it. When it comes to uh, publishing a paper and getting the data you want for the paper, I usually don't try to reuse the chip a lot of times, but when it's training, when you're just gathering large amounts of data, you can reuse the chip and clean it over and over again. So let's just say two to 10 times. Thank you, Evan. Uh, our next question is, is it possible to recover uh, the worms from, uh, after passing through the chip? Yeah, I'll, I'll just answer that one as well. It's definitely possible to recover the worms. Um, it's actually really simple. Um, you will just get all of the worms back out of the chip through the entrance tubing and you can choose to put them on an agar plate or put them in a tube or wherever you want. Um, you'll get the whole population back. You won't necessarily know which worm was in which channel, but you can definitely get uh, the population back and keep them going. Great, thank you, Evan. Um, here's a couple on to some applications. Uh, we're running a drug discovery program where we treat animals and image their neurons at a specific stage of development. How can we use the VivoChip platform for this? Um, so this is one of the things the VivoChip is, is best at. Um, if you can synchronize your worms uh, by whatever method necessary, either bleaching or, or filtering uh, the size to get uh, L1s, uh, you wait for however long you need to get it to the stage you're interested in. Uh, Treat with drugs also in the plates at whatever stage you want, and then put them in the viva chip and image them and look at the phenotype you're, you're interested in. So if you're doing a big screen, uh, that's where the viva chip 96X might, might come in useful because it's better for high throughput screening. I'll just add in as well that I, don't, I didn't really capture from the question what stage they're trying to image at, but again, we have specific vivo chip sizes for all different stages as well as if, if you have a mutant that has some degeneration or, or uh, slows down the growth, we'll be happy to talk with you about what chip size will probably fit best with what you have. But we have chip sizes from L1 through day five adults, so we should be able to fit 
whatever worm you want into one of these chips. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, a couple of, there's a couple on the um, our DART study. So for the developmental and reproductive toxicology assay, can you study the total brood size? Uh, so what our system does is it captures a snapshot uh, in time of the eggs in the worms at that particular stage of, uh, of their um, egg production. Uh, so if you want to study brood size, you'd be better off using uh, other methods like uh, looking at the eggs and the embryos on a plate or using the Coppas biosorter. But what the VMO chip can do is uh, it can uh, show you the individual embryos. So for example, if you don't know whether the embryos are not being produced or they're just not viable when they're inside the worm, you'd be able to tell this using the, the VMO chip. Great, thanks. Um, do you see an increase in stress levels due to immobilization? Uh, yeah, that was uh, not, uh, there, there will become stress if you leave them in the chip for like hours and hours at a time. Uh, but we've done the uh, neuro degeneration assays and immobilizing the chip for one to two hours and we don't see any obvious signs of increased degradation. Okay, here's a couple of technical questions. Um, uh, we are using, uh, there's several different kinds of microscope questions. We're using an upright microscope, uh, structured illumination microscope, a spinning disc microscope, different kinds of microscopes. Um, how can we use the vivo chip uh, with these different types of microscopes? Evan? I'll go ahead and uh, take that question, yeah. So the vivo chip is, made to be able to be used on pretty much any microscope. Um, if you have some unique or custom setup, we actually do build uh, custom adapters to make sure that the Vivo chip works in your microscope. Most microscopes, it'll just work in automatically, upright, inverted, spinning disc, confocals. Um, but if you have some unique or custom microscope, just get in contact with us. We'll, we'll find a way to make sure that it works in your microscope. And here's a related one, Evan. Um, can we use the vivo chip with a high resolution with high resolution imaging with a 1.3 na oil objective yes definitely so that's why we put it on a number one glass slide you can use any objective and oil objectives are totally fine whatever magnification um, it wouldn't be a problem with this vivo chip great and then there's a couple here on um, high throughput screening um, uh, let's summarize them to say, um, can you, can you, uh, do you have a high throughput screening platform for various assays, neurodegeneration or um, DART assays, it, basically talking about high throughput screening platform? So I think that's something that we would like to discuss because each, each application might have a slightly different custom platform that we, we have available. So please contact us if you do have an interest in high throughput screening, because that's our specialty with these chips and these uh, assays. So definitely get in contact with us and we'll talk with you directly about um, your specific assay. Great, well, we've just reached our 30 minute uh, time window. Uh, we are appreciative of everyone's time and, and uh, don't, don't want to um, uh, cause any kerfuffle with the rest of your day. Um, as I mentioned, um, any questions that did not get answered live will receive a, um, a direct response via email. Uh, the contact information is uh, up on the screen. Please follow us on our various uh, social media sites and we will announce our next webinar uh, time and date uh, on our website soon. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today.